Heavenly Father, prepare our hearts for your word and prepare me, Father, to deliver it. And give us the confidence, Father, that you are teaching us. You're not simply educating us. You're not simply informing us of something long ago, Father, but you're teaching us concerning who we are to be. Be mighty in our hearts, Father. Be mighty in our life. Wrestle with us, Father, as you did with Jacob. Drive us into a walk that is more abiding in you. Show us, Father, our mistakes in a clear-eyed way so that we would not excuse them. Remind us of your love for us and that we are accepted in Christ by our faith and that we are never far from you no matter what we do so that we'd never be discouraged. Call us to serve you, Father, so that we would see purpose in who we are in Christ. And keep our eyes on eternity, Father, on the day that we will see you face to face, on the world we will live in, in the kingdom that is yet to come with Christ ruling, so that this world, Father, will never be all that we care about. Let the scriptures have these high and and noble purposes uh, at work in our heart today. And most of all, Father, on a day that we recognize love in the earthly sense, let it never be lost on us, Father, that the true love, that the only real love, is the one that you show and give to us through Christ and that we therefore have to show others. Let us be self-sacrificial in our love so that we can reflect that truth to a world that needs to know you. And Lord, let our our study today enhance our message, encourage our hearts, uh, strengthen our resolve, soften our tone so that we would be truly loving to the world that needs to know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of Samson is coming to an end, and this study is a proof that in real life there are no good guys and there are no bad guys. They just don't exist. Yeah, there are heroes and there are villains, certainly. You can find them. But heroes are never without sin. And even the villains can see their lives put to good use by God's intended purpose. So, in truth, God is the only one who is good, sinful men by his mercy and grace, just have the opportunity to serve him. And Samson is a great example of this. Samson is just such a man. He was a hero. He was empowered by the Spirit. He was gifted with great strength. He was called to free Israel. But he was also a villain. He served himself. He squandered his strength. He chased after prostitutes and the daughters of his nation's enemy, the Philistines. And yet, above all of that, he was a man of faith. He was a man who at times pictures Christ in his story, which is what we'll look at again today. So as we finish the story of Samson, we need to take an opportunity to see him the way the Lord actually presents him in all sides of him, both the good and the bad. And in particular, I want you to note how God takes this man and uses him, uses his life all the way to the end to good purpose. Not though without making him an example too. You know, he's an example in a couple ways. He's first an example of the fact that even those who are called by God can at times fail to live up to the potential that God has for them. But then again, we also know he's a picture of Christ, something we'll see even more clearly today. How do we reconcile these two aspects of this man? Does it bother you at all when you look at the story of Samson to think that he's being used at times as a picture of Christ? Well, I hope not, because it's encouraging to know the Lord can take even the evil that we would do at times and use it to glorify himself. Not to excuse it, certainly, but just to remind us that God works with sinful men and women because that's all he has. The end of Samson's story is going to give us a unique opportunity to see this principle at work. Last time we saw him, you remember he was suffering in a prison, blind and miserable for having been taken prisoner by his enemies. And now I want you to see, as God has begun to work in his heart, how God can take someone at the lowest point in their life and use them to great good, to glorify himself. Let's pick up there in Judges 16. We're in verse 22. We read, However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaved off. Now the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and rejoice. For they said, Our god has given Samson our enemy into our hands, When the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has given our enemy into our hands, even the destroyer of our country, who has slain many of us. We studied last week that when Samuel, the writer, observes that Samson's hair begins to grow again in prison, 
He's sending us a powerful signal about something that's going on in Samson's heart. Samson has been sitting in this prison now for some time, and in that time, in the darkness of his blindness, he's had time to think and to reflect a little bit about why he's there, how he got there. He's suffering at the hands of the enemy, and he knows that his predicament is the result of his own foolishness. But I also think he's come to realize something else, which may explain why Samuel illustrates it in the mentioning of his hair. I think he's begun to realize that the Lord has allowed these circumstances to come upon him in order to teach him a valuable lesson. And as that lesson takes hold in the heart, repentance is the fruit. And as he repents, as he concerns himself with what he has done, his hair growing back is a symbol to us of a spark of light in that darkened heart of Samson. Meanwhile, Samson, as he languishes in chains, above him, his enemies, Israel's enemies, can't stop gloating or bragging over their victory over Samson. They assemble, we're told, to give sacrifice and to give thanks to their chief pagan god, a god called Dagon. They credit Dagon with giving Samson into their hands, and they sing praises to this pagan god for their victory. Ironically, it was supposed to be Israel who would gather before their god, Yahweh, and praise him for Samson's defeating of the Philistines. That's how this was supposed to play out, according to what was said about Samson in the beginning. But instead, what Samson did was he served himself, and so now it's Israel's enemies who are stronger, Israel's enemies who are gloating. Had he served the Lord, then the enemy would have been in the situation that Samson is in. Now, at this point in the celebration, we're told the Philistines decide they're going to parade a blind, chained Samson out before them. Now, remember previously Samson had moved with impunity within the land of the Philistines. You know, he had just gone into any town he wanted. He had walked through this land at any point. It makes you start to think that there wasn't much animosity between the Philistines and the uh, Jews, but that's not at all the case. If an ordinary Jewish man had done what Samson had done, if he had ventured into Philistine territory in this way, he would not have lasted very long. They would have either killed him or captured him and made him a slave. These two people were at enemies with one another. The only reason this hadn't happened to Samson is because Samson had the Spirit's anointing him with it, that miraculous strength. So he never feared the Philistines. He was literally like Superman. They didn't have the strength to stop him. He was able to single-handedly defeat entire armies. So he walked with impunity through the land of the Philistines because he knew they could do nothing to stop him, which, of course made them all the more angry. He mocked them in that way. Not only did he not commit himself to the mission that the Lord had given him, he refused to take his enemy seriously. And nothing could have been more foolish. Samson was only as invincible as the Lord allowed him to be. And since Samson didn't seek to please the Lord, well then Samson was taking great chance when he mocked the enemy that he was supposed to be defeating. Christians walk in Samson's footsteps anytime we do the same thing, anytime we take for granted God's grace and mercy by mocking the enemy. Now, how do we do that? Well, I'm not speaking in terms of an earthly enemy, obviously. I'm talking in the same terms that Peter talks when he says in 1 Peter 5, 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Peter tells us, that the key to living triumphantly in Christ, it starts not with a sense of triumph, but with a sense of humility. That is, just because you've received the Spirit, friends, just because you know you are a child of God by faith, just because your eternal uh, destiny is secure, that doesn't mean you can exalt yourself before God's timing. That doesn't mean we walk around like we're super people. It doesn't mean we pretend we're sinless. It doesn't mean we say we're, we're all that, that we've arrived. I mean, I know we don't say those things. Most of us don't, I hope. But isn't it true that sometimes our thoughts go that direction without us even realizing it? In that sense, we're making the same mistake Samson made. Samson's mistake was he used his physical strength to make himself someone important and invincible, or so he thought. Instead, what should he have done? He should have been humble. He should have cast his anxieties and needs upon the Lord, knowing that the Lord cared for him, as Peter said. And that's the same command to us. 
The command to us is to know that, yeah, one day we triumph. As they like to say, if you've read the end of the book, we win. Right? But that's the end of the book. Right? There's a whole lot in the middle. And what you read about in the middle is a lot of trial. A lot of testing. A lot of times in which the world will seem to be winning because the enemy has a certain degree of freedom that the Lord allows. But its purpose is good. It's good in the way it, tr- it grows us spiritually. It's good in the way that it reveals our own sin to us so that we won't be satisfied to live with it. It's good in the way that it gives us a cause to witness to the world who wonders, why do you have such hope in the face of such trial? You know, there's a lot of good things that come out of difficult circumstances. But we should not look at those moments and assume that because we are in Christ, that we can approach them with haughtiness, with prideful self-assurance. We're called, as Peter said, to be sober in spirit, which means not to be carried away with fleshly desires or inflated pride. Instead, be on alert, because he says the enemy's going to get someone. He's on a prowl, he's like a lion. You know, lions don't eat every gazelle. You know the old saying that I don't have to be fast enough to outrun a lion, I just have to be fast enough to outrun you? The point is to say that there's always someone who's slipping behind enough in their walk that the enemy has a target. Don't be that one. He's always working to find the weakness amongst us. When you give him something to work with, he'll make the most of it. Instead, he says, you should cast your anxieties on the Lord, be sober, be alert, be understanding the battle that is around us, and then wait for the time in which God will exalt us. That's the story of Samson's life. He failed to live in a humble way. He instead treated the enemy as someone to be toyed with. That was the lesson we saw with Delilah. And as a result, what did the Lord do? Eventually the Lord said, you know, you can't just do this forever. You had a purpose. And now you're mocking not only the enemy but me. And he gave Samson up to the enemy as an opportunity to bring Samson low. Friends, here's the point. Does God concern himself with our physical well-being above our spiritual well-being? Never. Our spiritual well-being has always and always will be more important to the Lord than our physical well-being. Because spiritually we're eternal, physically we're not. And therefore if the choice is between bringing him low physically so that his heart would repent in prison. Or letting him to continue having this physical strength so that his heart can continue to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, well, there really is no choice then because there's only one thing a good and loving father can do, which is what he did. Samson had not humbled himself, so the Lord found a way to do it for him under very trying circumstances, before his enemies. So after suffering Samson's mocking for so long, what do you think the Philistines are thinking now that they finally have him in their prison? Finally. (laughs) Right? Finally, they're going to have a chance to turn around and return the favor of mocking to him. So that's what we see now in verse 25. It so happened, when they were in high spirits, they said, Call for Samson that he may amuse us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he entertained them. And they made him stand between the pillars. Then Samson said to the boy who was holding his hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I might lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and about 3,000 men and women were on the roof looking on while Samson was amusing them. So this is a big event for Israel's enemies, right? They have not just captured their chief adversary. More importantly, they've conquered a man who represented Israel's God. He is the epitome. He is the manifestation of Yahweh, at least from the perspective of the Philistines. And now what they see is their God, Dagon, has shown himself to be more powerful than Israel's God, or so they presume, because of their circumstances. Look what's happened. Their God couldn't stand up to our God because we now have their hero in our chains, in our prison. So this is a big event. And you can imagine that the room is filled here with every dignitary, every leader, every ruler, every prince of the Philistines. We're here, all the lords of the Philistines. It's a way of saying all the important mighty people of the nation are in this one place now. Everybody is there. Anyone who is someone has attended. This temple was the chief temple in the land because it was dedicated to the Philistines' highest god, 
Dagon. So this god was the god of grain. His name actually means fish, but in, historically we can see from records of the time that his uh, purpose was to bring life through the production of grain. And he was worshipped not just here but throughout the region. There's evidence of Dagon temples in Syria and in Babylon. Uh, there was actually a Dagon temple dedicated in Bet Shan, which is a city within Israel, in the time of Saul. So this pagan god has obviously had a lot of influence in the region for quite some time. And it also helps to have some understanding of the temple itself. The temples that the Philistines built, remember the Philistines came from present-day Greece. So they brought a kind of Greco style with them when they built their temples. So Greek-style temples used a lot of freestanding columns to hold up a ceiling. The Romans were the ones who brought the arch that allowed you to put columns only on the side. The Greeks used them throughout. So you have these freestanding columns throughout the building. And in typical Greek style, you had an opening in the middle. So you'd have covered area held up by columns that kind of went around either in a C shape or maybe all the way around in a square, but with an open center in the middle of the building. And so what you would see under these circumstances are dignitaries inside under the covering, and then you would have the people who couldn't afford to be inside or who were not important enough. They were up on the roof. They could see what was going on inside because they'd be standing at the edge of the roof where there was the opening down into the building. 3,000 are on the roof. Who knows how many are inside? And they're all gathered to see where Samson is going to be, which is right in the middle of the circus. It says Samson is led by a small boy, because he's blind, obviously. So you have a small little child grabbing his hand, walking him in, parading him around in this little center area. This scene is proof, once again, of God's ironic sense of humor. Because think about it, Samson was once the one who loved to be the center of attention. He loved to be the guy at the party or the gathering who held court in front of everyone. He loved riddles. He loved tricks. Now he's on display like a court jester. And he's led around like a little goat, furthering his humiliation in front of the crowd. In the end, though, Samson's show is going to bring the house down. No, don't patronize me. And then when the show starts, Samson asks the little boy, could you lead me to a place where the pillars stand? And to understand what he's saying, to stand between the pillars would mean to be at the front edge of that open space right where the dignitaries were. So it's putting him very close to the audience. And it could be that they interpreted that as him wanting to get closer to the audience. And so that wouldn't have been of concern to them. But of course, he has some other reason for being there. Did you notice for a moment, though, the number of people that were said to be on the roof? Samuel reports 3,000 people were crammed on top of the roof. Now, besides that being a very large number, it's also a very specific number. The number three in Scripture is God's calling card. It's like his business card. Whenever you see the number three, it's the number of the triune Godhead. It is his signature, if you will. So when you hear that exactly 3,000 people, and keep in mind, this is not an estimate. It is exactly, which is to say God in his sovereignty brought 3,000 and only 3,000 people to sit on that roof. Not 2,999, not 3,001. There was a specific number. Samuel gives us the number. All of that is simply to say that God has brought this particular number to be to send us a message concerning this whole moment. And the message is pretty obvious. The Lord has brought Samson to this place under these circumstances so that Samson could complete the task he was given. What was the task he was given? To begin to free Israel from the oppression of the Philistines. Has he been doing that? Well, not really, which is why he's in prison with no eyes. But did the task ever stop being the task? Did that goal ever stop being the goal? Did God's word go out and return to him void? No. And now that Samson's heart has returned to the Lord then it stands to reason that Samson himself has also begun to recognize that this is the moment of the Lord's work. And when he does make that recognition, then Samson realizes, ah, the Lord in his grace has given me another opportunity to do the very thing I was called to do in the first place, but didn't do when I had the chance. In fact, this situation is even better than anything Samson might have imagined or orchestrated on his own behalf. Because before him is assembled every important person in the land of the Philistines. Had Samson gone out to battle in the way God intended in the beginning against the Philistines, I'm sure the Lord would have brought it to success as God planned. 
But it's hard to imagine that Samson would have ever gotten a better moment than the one he's got now. That is, would he have ever had a chance to eliminate every single leader of the Philistines in one fell swoop? Where else could this possibly have taken place? They have been assembled before him as if on a silver platter. All that's required now is that Samson recognize the opportunity and act in faith like he would have, should have, could have been doing all along. And Samson, I believe, has made that connection and does recognize that he has this opportunity. There's just one problem. And the problem is he has no power. He's chained. He's blind. He's without his strength. Samson is in the perfect place to do everything God has called him to do. And yet he now, ironically, lacks the power that would enable him to do it. That leaves only one option. Verse 28. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time, O God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and braced himself against them, the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed in his life. There's a couple of different ways to imagine what must have happened. Uh, I've read several versions there's those who think he maybe pushed them apart left to right like this. There's others, though, that imagine that he may have just been pushed against them forward like this, two on either side. It really doesn't matter. Obviously, the outcome is the same either way. And as the young boy positions him there, Samson cries out to the Lord. This is the first time in Samson's story he's done this, going all the way back to the beginning. The first time he has ever appealed to the Lord for a blessing to accomplish the mission that he had been given from birth. He asked the Lord, Grant me strength just one last time. And with this opportunity, I can accomplish the mission. Now, notice his words aren't exactly the words I just used. He speaks specifically of avenging his own misfortune, which I think is testimony to the fact that even as we move in faith, in repentance, it doesn't mean that we automatically leave behind that side of our nature that has been the source of compromise from the beginning. This man's pride is still there. It's not a Hollywood story. You don't wake up one day and suddenly you are a saint. That's not real life. And the scriptures are nothing if not real. Therefore, you see this man still thinking in personal terms, but his actions definitely demonstrate faith in the promises of God. And we'll see that here clearly as we look down through the text. He's avenging the loss of his eyes, but he is ultimately advancing the purposes of God's plan in what he was told his mission was, that is, to defeat the Philistines. So with this prayer, notice what he does next. Now, think in terms of Samson at this moment. He's blind. And remember we said when the Spirit left him back in the time of Delilah, did he feel that? Did he sense that? No. In fact, he got up out of that sleep thinking he would just throw his enemies off only to discover, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can't do it anymore. What happened? And when we looked at that, we remarked that the Spirit's coming and going. It doesn't have some kind of buzzing sensation in our body. All right? That's not the way the Spirit works. So just as he did not feel the Spirit's departure, there's no indication here that he has felt the Spirit return in any way. Which would mean that he's speaking a request and then acting in faith. He pushes. Now he could just as easily have made a complete fool of himself. Had the Lord not granted that request, he'd been sitting there going, argh, argh. It takes a man who has confidence to act on the word of God. He's not just acting here because he wants something for himself. He's acting in confidence that this is what God has empowered him to do in the first place. And as you see, the Lord grants him his request. He gets his strength just long enough that he can bring the roof down, killing all the Philistines who are gathered there to mock Samson. And the Lord grants Samson not just that request, but the second one as well. He requested not only that he could press, he requested that he could die. And the Lord granted him that as well and let him die in the process. His repentant heart led him to accomplish, the writer says, far more in death than he ever managed to accomplish in his life. Because for years, Samson lived and ruled as a judge of Israel with supernatural strength. And yet, think about this, friends, in all the time he ruled, some 20 years, if you count them up in the scripture, he couldn't kill even 3,000 Philistines. Only now, in this final moment, 
has he reached that number? And you would expect, given his capabilities, that he could have done far more damage to the enemy had he set his mind to it. It's really an indictment, as you read it here, that he was only now able to reach that number. Still, the Lord made the most of it. Because the 3,000 he killed were the most important in the land. And as a result, Philistines are greatly weakened here. And he is, as a result, recorded, Samson is recorded, in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. Does that surprise you? Some wonder why a man like Samson, with his track record, would ever be included in a list of the greatest examples of faith, as the writer of Hebrews records. Doesn't that strike you as a bit generous, that Samson would be included? Well, here's the answer, friends. The answer is to remember the writer's purpose in that chapter. The writer of Hebrews is not writing a list of people who were perfect. That's not the purpose. If you think that's what faith looks like, then let me assure you, it's not. The writer of Hebrews spoke of men and women who did what? They exemplified faith in the Word of God. And with that faith, they had a willingness to seek reward in the kingdom by pleasing God in their actions. And look at what we see now in Samson's ending act. In the last moments of his life, he does exactly what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. He pressed on the pillars, expecting them to fall. Why? Because he knew the Spirit had been given to him in the first place for a specific cause, and his faith in that prophetic word is now evidenced through an action here. God told his mother, you're going to have a son who's going to begin to free your people from the Philistines. Samson said, I assume, well, you know what? Up to this point in my life, that prophetic word about me has not yet come true. I haven't done that yet. But I'm still alive. And God's word can't be given out and not come back to him fulfilled. So therefore, I have confidence that he's going to grant this request. Because if he doesn't, I don't see how else I can do what he's calling me to do. And the proof of his faith is seen in his efforts to push. The only reason he pushed is because he had faith the Lord would grant his Request And the only reason that Samson had any expectation that his request would be granted is because of the previously spoken word of God. He died a man of faith, broken, low. But friends, he was redeemed by faith. He asked to die with the Philistines. And I wonder if he didn't ask to die with the Philistines because he preferred to die knowing he had a reward waiting for him than to live under the circumstances he was in, blind and in chains. Samson is probably the judge you and I most clearly identify with as believers, at least I do, not because I possess superhuman strength, none of us do, but because we share the same confused record of service in loyalty to the Lord, right? We've got good days and we've got bad days and perhaps a lot more bad days than we care to remember. And the closer you get to the end of your life, the more assured you will grow in the promises of God. And as you consider the kingdom and the rewards that it offers, you'll begin to concern yourself a lot more with fulfilling your mission. I think Samson is a perfect picture of that. As death became more real, the need to serve God became more important. In the words of Paul, he says in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, if there was ever a man who could look back on his life with regret, it would have been Paul, especially when it came to the church. And Paul said, you know, if I do that, if I spend my time looking backward, I'll never get anywhere. There'll be so much self-recrimination, there'll be so much guilt, there'll be so much worry that God can't use a man like me, there'll be so much doubt that I'll never turn my eye to what he's given me to do. Instead, he says, I just look forward. Speaking of Christ, the end of Samson's life brings us another picture of Messiah. I want, to, I want to end this story taking a closer look at Samson's life as a picture and in general how God has used that. Because to understand Samson as Christ puts a capstone on his life that's important to understanding how God uses all of us. We noted last week that Samson's capture by the Philistines was made possible because Delilah was paid 30 pieces of silver. Remember? And of course that's a picture of what was paid when Jesus was betrayed by Judas. But that scene with Delilah also brings additional parallels. Because like Samson, Jesus was tempted three times to give up his power. When the enemy came to him and offered him alternatives to what the Father had offered him, he was given a choice to have essentially similar things, but under very different circumstances, if only he would obey Satan instead of obeying the Father. And what did Jesus do with each of those opportunities? He turned it down. He gave back word that resisted that temptation. Just as Samson had three opportunities with Delilah to give up his power, to tell Delilah the secret, and three times Samson resisted 
by speaking back words to her. But in the fourth attempt by Delilah, Samson gave himself up. He fully confessed the truth. He put it right in front of her and said, here's what you have to do. Remember? Likewise, Satan's fourth attempt to defeat Jesus, this time through Judas, was successful. But friends, it wasn't successful because the enemy got the upper hand. It was successful, as John says in John 10.18, quoting Jesus, No one has taken my life away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So just as in the fourth attempt by Delilah, Samson willingly gave up what was required to take his life, take his freedom in this case. Similarly, Jesus did that when the time was right through Judas. And then, as Samson is being led away by his enemies, what's his condition? Well, he's blind. He's in chains, bound. And he's humiliated. Likewise, we're told by Luke that Jesus was led away blindfolded, that he was mocked by the Roman authorities. Mark reports that he was bound Then back to Samson, we're seeing Samson today brought out to entertain his oppressors, just as Jesus was led out before Herod and mocked before Herod and led out before Pilate similarly. Later, Paul says Jesus suffered shame on the cross in that he was without clothes and that he was killed in public view, hung on a cross. Finally, Samson entered prison, but he went into prison only so that he could then leave and in the process bring down a temple. Then again, so did Jesus. He made a very similar journey. Peter says Jesus entered into the place of prison for the departed spirits. In 1 Peter chapter 3.18 we read, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. And when Jesus departed, we're told that he set free those who were his in Ephesians 4.8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, well, what does it mean? Except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. Christ sets free the captives and he did it by setting us free from the law. Hebrews 8.13 says, when he said a new covenant, it meant he made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. When Christ came and inaugurated the new covenant in his blood, it wasn't just the law that disappeared, but the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices, all that came from the law was also done away with. So just as Samson took down a stone temple, so did Jesus. And then as the destruction of that pagan temple required Samson's death, well, so did the destruction of the old covenant and the law and the tabernacle require Jesus' death on the cross. John 2.19, Jesus answered them saying, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So just as Samson was crushed in the temple, Scripture says Jesus was crushed for our iniquity. And then finally, Jesus' body was cared for in death by friends who took it away and buried him in a tomb and Similarly, we read in Judges now, last verse of the chapter, verse 31. Then his brothers and all his father's household came down, took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. Thus he judged Israel for 20 years. Now, obviously, when you look at all these parallels, and there's others we've studied, probably more I could find if we spent enough time searching for them, then It reminds us first of the inspired nature of God's word, right? That God had orchestrated Samson's life so that all of these details would be there, so that it would speak of things yet to come in Christ. You see the hand of God on history. But more to the point today, when you see that a man like Samson is useful fodder to God as a picture of the perfect, holy Messiah, then it reminds us that God can still use us too. Perhaps you're thinking, well, you know, I think this lesson is coming too late in my life. Maybe you're wondering if you've squandered your opportunities. You haven't served him enough. You haven't pleased him enough. It's late in your life. Yeah, he called you. Maybe he equipped you. But you're wondering, you know, what if I've set that opportunity aside now for too long and it's just not something in my life anymore? I'm like the Samson who never got good. If that's where your heart is today, then pay attention to the end of Samson's story more so than the beginning. Samson repented. Samson came to realize the Lord was still calling him. Samson took a step of faith. He prayed to God to use him. And as a result, when he put his shoulder to the work, with that one small step of faith, the end of his life accomplished far more than the whole of his life accomplished before it. 
Take note of that. Take note of that mercy from God, the grace of God. The Lord allows Samson to do a great thing, even after so many years of disobedience. Why? Because he repented, because he walked in faith. That's all it took. But not only did God do that, the Lord recorded Samson's life here and again in the hall of faith to his credit. And then above all of that, the Lord made Samson's life a reflection of his beloved son, our Messiah. If God can take a man like Samson with all of the baggage that we've seen in this man's life, can he not do the same for you and me? Don't let the enemy convince you that you're washed up or that the Lord has given up on you or the Lord is beyond using you, like you've ruined your chances. Friends, you never had a chance if you're thinking of it in terms of your own abilities or your own worth. No one has that inherently. What we have instead is a loving God who has called us and made us one of his by faith, washed us clean by the blood of Christ, and because of that and only because of that, he delights to use us. And if you say no to him a million times in service to him, that does not preclude the potential that he uses you the one millionth and first time, provided we come back to him in repentance. If you return to him, great things can still happen. And friends, I should add, if you have never strayed, then you don't know the truth. Because <laughs> you have. <laughs> But if you're in a good spot right now, or so you think, well, be renewed in your confidence that you can serve him, that you can accomplish great things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Samson's life is uh, such a remarkable life. Few of us, Father, can say that we started with what Samson started with, the kind of unique and singularly powerful set of gifts given by the Spirit, Father. That is, uh, that is certainly not the average testimony. But still, Father, so many of us can identify with his life, with his mistakes, with his shortcomings, with his lack of focus on the mission, with his desire to feed the flesh. Who isn't that person from time to time? But Father, if it's true that we can be like him in those days, then it's just as true we can be like him in his last day. We can be a man or woman who seeks to please you in faith, <clears throat> having repented of the things we've done wrong and having seen now your work around us and an opportunity once more to join in. Father, we can be just like a Samson. We can step in to that work and you can do great things through us. I pray, Father, that for those in this room who have felt left aside, unworthy, those who may feel they've wasted too much time or have simply set you aside for the world, I pray, Father, that Samson's story would be a reminder that uh, as long as we have breath in our lungs, the opportunity remains for your grace, your love, your forgiveness. It never exhausts, Father. And that's, that's all we need to know. I pray, Father, that our hearts would turn to you, our desire to serve you would be reignited and that we begin to make the new decisions you ask us to make. And then, as we do that, Father, encourage us by working through us. For we know you love us, Father, on this Valentine's Day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.